Evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to let everyone get into the, the webinar here, take a, another minute or two. Evening, everyone. We're just going to give it another minute here. Let's get everyone back in. And we'll give it about 30 more seconds here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our Friday webinar series. Today's webinar is Ask the Experts, Coping During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is Brett Spitali, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Please note that earlier today, we shared a message with the community regarding the upcoming 2020 Bleeding Disorders Conference. As the COVID-19 pandemic unfolds, it is clear that in the face of an unprecedented situation, we need to make difficult decisions to protect the health of our community and staff. NHF will now host the 2020 Bleeding Disorders Conference virtually in order to keep our community safe and help prevent the spread of COVID-19. By creating a virtual environment for the 2020 Bleeding Disorders Conference, we will make the experience consistent with top level education you are used to receiving from NHF. 2020 BDC will take place virtually from August 1st through August 8th. As we work through the details, we will keep you informed as the new format of the conference continues to unfold. Now let's get back to the webinar. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will pose to the panel after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Monday the 4th. I'd like to introduce our panelists this evening. Dr. Len Valentino is the President and CEO of the National Hemophilia Foundation. Dr. Peter, Peter Cuedos is the Medical Director at the Mary M. Gooley Hemophilia Treatment Center and attending staff hematologist at Rochester Regional Health. And Dr. Margaret Bragney, Professor of Medicine and Clinical Translational Science, and Director of the Hemophilia Center at Western PA University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. We thank them for taking the time to join us. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Valentino to get us started. Len? Thank you, Brett, and good morning or good evening to everybody on the call. We appreciate uh, your time with us, and we hope that we can provide some information for you that you can use during this uh, pandemic. So on my first slide, I've put in a map of the United States signaling out the hotspots around the country, uh, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, Arizona. Uh, you can see Georgia, New York. Uh, Chicago still are, are areas that are our hotspots. On the next slide, we look at the numbers, and you can see that there's a um, uh, continuing increase in the number of cases in the United States. Uh, currently, there's, uh, as of uh, today, there's more than 1,094,000 cases in the United States and almost 65,000 deaths. Globally, there's 3,329,000 cases and more than 237,000 deaths. The numbers uh, continue to increase globally as well as in the United States. Next slide. So what are the symptoms of COVID-19 and what should you be looking for? Well, the CDC has always told us about cough and shortness of breath, but there's been additional symptoms that have been added to the list. And these now include the loss of taste or smell, sore throat, headache, muscle pain, shaking chills, chills, and fever. Next slide. When do you think you might have symptoms that are severe enough to seek medical attention? Well, of course, if you have trouble breathing, persistent chest pain, or pressure in your chest, new confusion or inability to arouse somebody, bluish lips or a blue face, you should immediately call 911.
but it's important for the bleeding disorders population to, if you have uh, symptoms, to notify your hemophilia treatment center. And certainly before you go to the emergency room or to the hospital, call ahead and your physician may give you additional uh, information and directions, especially uh, uh, with some of the uh, treatments that some patients are on. And I know Dr. Quides and Dr. Ragni will talk a little bit more about this when we get into some of the questions and answers. Next slide. <clears throat> we know that this is a very stressful uh, period of time with lots of anxiety and people are at risk for depression. There's several types of uh, uh, stress that are shown on the next slide. And these include some stresses that are actually positive in your life and can uh, uh, be helpful. But what we're worried about is toxic uh, uh, stress. And this uh, can be uh, due to prolonged activation of stress responses. Uh, and these are ones that we really need to deal with. A couple of weeks ago, we dealt with stress in one of our webinars. Next slide. And I think it's important that we all do things that we can uh, try to alleviate some of our stress during this period of time. This includes getting adequate amount of sleep, exercise, which we also talked about in last week's webinar, healthy eating, spirituality, and then finding other areas that you can hit use as an outlet, art, you, talking to friends, and looking at nature, etc. So it's important that we all try to find time to alleviate some of our stress. Next slide. Well, what are the types of exercise that we can safely do? Our physiotherapists that were on last week were talking about this, and during COVID-19, it's important to be active. Physical activity can include uh, sports participation, cycling, walking, dance, gardening, and house cleaning. Maybe we don't want to really do the house cleaning, but it's still a form of exercise. Uh, we want to stay safe during these periods of time when we're doing these exercises. So by all means, uh, social distancing remains an important component. Uh, wear a mask if you're outside, according to the recommendations. And of course, uh, washing your hands uh, or using a hand sanitizer. Telemedicine has become an important component of the healthcare delivery during this period of time during the pandemic. It's important that if you are going to uh, contact your physician, uh, you can be prepared and you, you may be offered a visit by telemedicine. Next slide. So how can you prepare yourself for this visit? Be sure that your iPad or your phone is charged. Be ready uh, to interact with your physician by finding uh, a, a quiet place where you're undisturbed. And of course, be ready to answer the questions and provide information, just like you would if you were visiting your physician or hemophilia treatment center uh, in, in a face-to-face -face type of visit. These visits can be very productive, and we know that many of the hemophilia treatment centers are now providing virtual visits using telemedicine. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn over to some questions that, that we know that you all may have. The first question that I'll ask our panelists is, do we think that there's a threat to the supply chain for products that are used to treat our bleeding disorders? Dr. Ragni or Quides? I'll be happy to jump in. Um, as I understand through MASAC, who has issued some advisories during this time, there's absolutely no known threat to the supply chain. In fact, there's been an effort to assure that patients even have two weeks of additional uh, supply uh, that is okayed by their insurer. And so that we, uh, I, think, I think that is not a real risk we have to worry about. And I just want to say, unlike, um, you know, our uh, colleagues in uh, the cancer care arena, where there are shortages because many of the uh, new medications are being uh, manufactured in China, we haven't had that issue with our products. Uh, um, to my knowledge, we don't have any specific that are just solely relied upon production in China. You would probably know better, uh, Dr. Valentino. Yeah, thank you both. So we're in constant contact with all of the manufacturers of products that are used to treat hemophilia and von Willebrand disease. And we are uh, assured by all of the manufacturers that the supply chain is stable and we don't anticipate any changes in that. 
We do recommend, however, as Dr. Ragney indicated, that patients have an adequate supply of medication in their home. Uh, we don't want you to stockpile it because that potentially creates a resource uh, uh, challenge for other patients. So we want you to make sure that you have enough product uh, on hand for yourself uh, by ordering uh, when you're down to a two week supply. So maybe we'll go to the next question. So how should I manage my home inventory of products? Do I need to stockpile? I think we've really addressed this question that we don't have to stockpile products. And we really want you to uh, keep your uh, uh, supply, about a month supply and reorder when you're at two weeks. Uh, Dr. Ragni or Equides, do you have any other comments on that? No, that's it. Just as a related uh, question, some patients or other uh, providers have asked us, uh, should we, have them lengthen out their prophylaxis, maybe stop prophylaxis, particularly if they're not as active. And uh, we think that would be counterproductive. Yeah, so the recommendation has been to stay on your current regimen. But again, if you have any questions, please contact your physician or hemophilia treatment center and talk to them about your concerns. Yeah. Next question. Should I consider changing my product? Why or why not? It would probably not be a good time to change a product for uh, several reasons. It might be difficult to actually get insurers to uh, discuss it or agree to it. It might be that you have a side effect with a new drug and you would have a lot less uh, likelihood of an in-person meeting. We're doing most of our clinic visits by telemedicine. Uh, in addition, uh, it would be uh, confusing to a number of folks, including those who uh, actually care for you, uh, based on records we're using right now, based on exactly what you're doing. So to change things uh, without contacting your center or even having the time to uh, monitor, to assure that you're doing well on a product, is really a little more difficult now. And uh, if, if you were having an allergic reaction to a product, of course, that would be a major consideration. But outside of that, or if it's not working, certainly. Uh, but we're actually uh, doing telemedicine in my clinic and uh, every patient uh, is, we discuss their drugs, how it's working, what we need to do. And so we're doing any uh, urgent change, absolutely. But outside of that, we would not recommend it. One of the exceptions would be uh, one of my patients uh, who's uh, about six years old, and uh, finally the mother was able to, uh, you know, do home infusion with the lactate, but uh, uh, had some challenges recently and would often come to the center, um, you know, for us to help do that. And uh, she herself uh, brought up about switching to Hem Libra and felt this would be the time to do it. And uh, we actually are doing that, Maggie, because uh, the child is really doesn't have good IV access right. anymore. So that's actually a good reason to change. Um, one needs to monitor that patient, and as long as that can be done, that makes good sense. Thank you both. So our next question really is more about a patient who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. And the question is, how should I manage my prophylaxis treatment if I'm diagnosed with COVID-19? Well, I, Peter, do you want to do that first? Or uh, I'm certainly happy to address it. Um, really, you don't want to change what you're already doing that works well. Uh, if you are diagnosed with COVID-19, the most important things that you will do is talk to your physician at your HTC, or if you're not able to, have your family contact the HTC because there's a lot that we talk about with doctors about hemophilia to help them understand because many of the doctors in the hospital don't know about your lab tests and how you're managed and what's critical. Uh, because there may be some bleeding, not much, with this uh, a virus, 
really, we're not recommending any change whatsoever. I think we've been really reassured uh, that there's really not much that would change if you had the infection. Certainly, if we were talking about treating COVID-19, and uh, that would be, for example, with heparin, um, we would want to very closely monitor you. If you're on prophylaxis, that would be just excellent. Uh, if you were not on prophylaxis and started on heparin, that might be a time that we would use factor in the hospital, but that's not necessarily prophylaxis at home, but it would be prophylaxis in the hospital. Peter, do you want to add anything to that? I'll touch upon it uh, when I, you know, talk about the clotting issues. Okay, thank you. So our next question is, are people with bleeding disorders at an increased risk for COVID-19 disease and or excess morbidity or mortality? In general, uh, they're not, and we've tried to reassure them. Uh, the World Federation of Hemophilia has sent, it developed a very uh, helpful uh, uh, bulleted list of uh, some of these issues. And at the top, it's to remind uh, the patients that they're not, in general, not at an increased risk. The exception, of course, would be our patients who are at the same time uh, compromised uh, by their immune system with other conditions. Uh, perhaps they're on, you know, steroids for rheumatoid arthritis, or perhaps uh, uh, they, uh, you know, have contracted uh, uh, through, you know, their prior history uh, of uh, product, um, HIV, hepatitis C, um, from that generation, our older patients. Um, and then I think maybe Maggie could address this issue. There's some thought that maybe theoretically patients with inhibitors, even if they're not on immunosuppression, occasionally they may be receiving a drug like rituximab, but if they're not, are they at a higher risk? What do you think? Well, maybe? and you know, really, uh, I'm not aware of any patient in whom this, this problem has been raised with if there is any uh, associated morbidity mortality. Of course, we can worry about those things, but I think we should be reassured more than anything. And I also believe that if you should have uh, the disease and have to be in the hospital, I think what you really want is for your physician to be in touch with those physicians, both to manage you and to monitor you. And I think we'll talk about that when we talk about Hemlibra as, an, as an, another drug that the hospital uh, may not be aware of. But I really am not aware of any uh, mortality or morbidity uh, in our population. And I would just like to put a plug that uh, if God forbid one of our patients does develop COVID-19, uh, we hope that their uh, hemophilia treatment center provider will eventually enter that information. Our colleagues at the University of Minnesota, Joan Beckman and Lisa Krieger through HRS is uh, doing a benign hematology uh, module. Uh, so we could, uh, you know, track, we could obtain information about such patients. And I believe Athen uh, will be in the process of such a module too. Yeah, so we, we, we've gotten uh, confirmation from uh, uh, Athen that there, a question has been added to the clinical manager about COVID-19. And there'll be additional data collected uh, afterwards in the next update to the Athen uh, clinical manager so that we will have more information available about the impact of COVID-19 uh, in the bleeding disorders community. And then I assume also your patient initiated survey NHF is doing with Michelle Wickop, is that probably gonna have many questions, right? Yes. So our next question is, should I consider participating in a clinical trial for my hemophilia now? And maybe uh, our, our panelists can also address the sort of the current situation of clinical trials. Right. Um, I, I'd be happy to take that. Um, we have a couple uh, investigator-initiated NIH trials at my site, as well as many other pharmaceutical trials. What we are doing, as is the rest of NIH-funded trials and in my institution, if you uh, are on a trial in which you are receiving an interventional agent, the only uh, concern is that if getting that agent increases your risk and your disease, uh, you might be able to continue. But for all the trials we're doing, they are non-essential that you, they are not necessarily needed for treatment at this time, then you would not enroll and you would not uh, take any new drug. This is a great time, however, to do Athen trials where you are actually uh, 
filling out forms, uh, you know, being seen, adding to data and registries, that's a great thing to do. But we're really avoiding, uh, you know, we're doing mostly remote monitoring, and this is not a time to increase your risk to getting COVID just because you're interested in a trial. We do, however, anticipate that trials will resume once we have a vaccine and we're back in uh, the clinic, but I think for now, we are not enrolling any new patients and there's no intervention unless it's essential. Yeah, and I'll add that uh, Peter alluded to it, but our uh, community uh, uh, tool, MyBDC, does have a COVID-19 question in it currently, so we are looking to gather that information oh, that's great. from the hemophilia community. So an, another question that comes up uh, often is, what are my risks for stroke and blood clots if I have COVID-19? Well, you know, the interesting thing about COVID is that it's, mo it's different than most types of clotting problems. Specifically, well, there are as many as 15 to 20 percent may or 25 percent may have blood clots. The clots that form in this disease are more likely to be very small, which we call microvascular. And the main site those are located is in the lungs. These are very different from uh, other types of clotting where you have disseminated bleeding and disseminated clotting. It's not like something called DIC that is very unusual in this disease. It's much more like sepsis-induced uh, clotting. But the bottom line is you have a risk for these clots but you are, uh, they're very rare. Uh, and one of the things that has been uh, tried and shown to be very effective is low molecular weight heparin, but this is not based on a lot of data from COVID, although it has shown in small studies to be helpful. This is based on data in critical care if you're in the ICU. They've shown that using heparin is very critical for inflammation to break it down. That's a problem in COVID. Uh, it is, of course, an anticoagulant that would reduce uh, deep vein thromboses. Um, and there's also uh, a, even a question of an antiviral effect. And heparin uh, is a, uh, an anionic compound that actually prevents COVID from uh, viral attachment. Uh, of cells. So there's a lot of very good drugs, uh, specifically heparin, um, but we really have to be very, very uh, careful because there, this is very early in this pandemic and we don't have a lot of highly powered randomized controlled trials. So what we mostly have is anecdote and we just don't have a lot of information. While there may have been a few strokes, this is very rare. Arterial clots are not common. Uh, so those are those are the things I would say, uh, Peter. I agree, and I'll uh, cover some of that in uh, my slide deck. Okay. So our next question is um, specific to the patients who are taking Heme Libra, and what are my risks for uh, blood clots if I'm taking Heme Libra? So Maggie's been a leading clinical researcher in this area, so I'd like her to go uh, ahead. Well, thank you, but I'm not sure that's the case. But uh, what I would say is there's absolutely no evidence to uh, show or that we know of that suggests that if you're taking Hemleader, you're at any other greater risk of blood clots than anyone else. What I would say that's most important is that if you're taking Hemlibra, your monitoring of that being on that drug uh, is, is modified. In other words, the tests that we use in the hospital to look for COVID, as well as to treat with heparin, involve something called the PTT. And Hemlibra interferes with that assay. It could make it look normal when in fact it's prolonged. That's why it is so critical if you happen to go to the emergency room or the ICU to be in touch with your physician and your hemophilia treatment center so they can help manage that PTT and help the doctors rec recognize that mm -hmm. it actually look more normal than you would expect. And um, of course, we have no evidence more for more clots, nor do we expect that to be the case. Even if you needed to take heparin, if you were in the ICU, I would not change anything and I would monitor you very, very closely 
for bleeding, which I think Chem Libra is in a great preventer of bleeds. And I think there's nothing specific that anyone would recommend at this time. And there are absolutely no data. So there, there's actually a, a question that, that came in that I'd like to address at this point. And the question is, we know that patients with COVID are put on blood thinners. How does that work with somebody that's on Heme Libra where we can't uh, monitor the patient uh, as accurately as we might uh, in other situations? Right. So I think what that would require, so that's the exact thing I was talking about with that PTT test. It looks a little better so that you might give heparin. If you were giving it, the PTT would look like you didn't give it. So there are other lab tests that we can use. There's something called thrombin, uh, a TEG, uh, uh, L uh, thromboelastography, but there are other ways to monitor that, but there is no reason to suspect that it will contribute to more bleeding, but that's where it is critical that your physician be notified because they need to make sure the physicians in the ICU managing you recognize that having a normal APTT does not mean you didn't have heparin or you didn't respond. In fact, you probably did respond. You just can't use that lab to monitor. So again, it's having a good relationship between you and your physician, your family and your physician immediately talking about this and then communicating with the hospital physician. Yeah, and I, I think you, you've pretty much addressed our next question, which is can you talk about what lab monitoring should be done for patients that are on Heme Libra? Any additional comments there? No, I mean, it's, it's these unusual ways to check clotting, uh, but unfortunately the PTT cannot be used if a lab doesn't have a chromogenic uh, assay that won't work. Uh, so really the TEG, which is used in the ICU every day is the best way to do it. That's the thromboelastography. Thank you, Dr. Ragney. So I, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Quides for a few minutes while he uh, talks about a couple issues with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Valentino, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be involved in this. I um, have attended a number of these, and uh, it gives me a chance to first preface um, my uh, presentation with a few comments. The first uh, is to um, officially welcome you, Len, as president of NHF, is my dear friend and colleague over 20 years. Um, you are truly, in my book, an MVP, uh, not only valuable at this time, but if you need such leadership uh, in every type of organization. So we're very blessed to have you. But MVP, Len, because you're most versatile. I can't think of a more qualified person in terms of being a leading researcher renowned, having been one of the leaders in studying uh, joint bleeding. And I can't think of someone also who has that background of over 20 years running an HP and knowing all the nuances and policy issues. And then someone in addition who worked um, you know, in industry for a few years. Uh, so really, I could not believe that anybody else could have been considered. You're incredibly qualified and you're very grateful. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, if you can uh, just see my background, uh, this is a new normal. We usually do all our uh, visits uh, by Zoom. This is my office, and the new normal means that we all are wearing uh, scrubs at work and uh, our little logo and jacket and change them every day. And obviously have our uh, you know, uh, face mask. So uh, this is a shout out to my dear wife, who's not only a phenomenal physician, but uh, she should have her, home, her own HGTV show. She's incredibly crafty. So she's designed these, uh, these uh, face masks. It's a great prototype. It's with, uh, these are uh, shoelaces and we just uh, adjust it this way. And uh, it doesn't uh, hurt your ears or anything like that. And then when I see a patient, uh, then, you know, this is, uh, you know, what we have to wear. So the reason I show you that is uh, the simple fact that a telehealth visit is much better than coming to see me. Because if you see me, I'm in a mask. And I'm also uh, wearing this. If you're coughing, we then have to put the N95 mask, uh, which we guard with our lives because we only are issued one uh, per week. Um, so, uh, so there are some advantages of doing telehealth. You get to see my face. And uh, for as much as Dr. Tell, uh, Valentino made the point that you should do it in a quiet place, 
I love it when they have their pets uh, because they usually can't bring them to the center and uh, we get to relate uh, further. So uh, that's a, a good part of uh, the visit. So just very briefly, I'm going to emphasize the fact that one of the main complications of this infection, thankfully, is not bleeding, but it's body. And it all starts at the left of the screen in terms of the, uh, the SARS uh, virus. And then it leads downstream to a series of events that ultimately can uh, lead to a blood clot there on the lower right-hand part of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see how there's also the clotting factors. And that's part of a cascade. And if we think about a cascade, it's kind of like a domino effect. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been watching cat videos. <laughs> so if you think of the virus on to the uh, left of that white cat, it leads to a series of events that ultimately can lead uh, to a clot. Next slide. You can really be mesmerized watching all these uh, cat videos. <laughs> and um, again, uh, this is a microscopic view. The end result is that these clots form. And uh, next slide. If we then look at the 30,000 foot view, the end result of these clots would be uh, blood clots both and or the legs and into the lungs. They can first develop in the legs, particularly if you have COVID infection and you're in the hospital, you're absolutely not gonna be that active in the hospital. You're not gonna be doing somersaults. And uh, so clots can develop in the legs or they can uh, develop right in the lungs. And as Dr. Ragney mentioned, uh, they can often be microscopically in the, uh, the lungs uh, also. And uh, one of the events that can lead to the patient's demise would be the clot in the lungs. Next slide. So that's uh, a pulmonary embolus. And often the chest x-ray will be very uh, normal, but uh, over half the time, but on a specific dedicated CT scan, they will uh, you know, show that uh, the, the uh, negative image of the clot, that blue box there. And those are some of the symptoms patients could experience. Next slide. So during this uh, time, um, there's been an incredible explosion of information. My head is spinning every day from all these uh, uh, reports on the internet and the literature. Um, it's uh, incredible how many reports. It seems like every hour there's a new publication about some new uh, hematological complication, but the big complication is clotting, what we call thrombosis. And for those who are, uh, they have severe infection to the point of needing to be in the intensive care unit, often needing to be on a ventilator, the risk of a blood clot is quite high. It's uh, up to a third of uh, those patients. And I was, uh, you know, we're all on this roller coaster ride. So I admittedly earlier this week uh, had a down moment uh, thinking about this, about uh, COVID infection, how it's impacting on my patients as well as our own personal lives. And um, I wanted to uh, look at the glass half uh, full and I uh, tweeted this out. Um, some of you may uh, follow, a number of us are involved with this Team Twitter project. And uh, the best is our dear colleague, uh, Michael Macris in Sheffield in the UK. Um, and I joked to Mike that I probably no longer have to attend any meetings because he's such a great font of uh, information. Uh, but uh, it's possible uh, having uh, a condition like hemophilia, where you have the tendency not to clot but to bleed, that may protect uh, the development of a severe infection. And again, this is a shout out to uh, the NHF uh, survey project among patients that's patient initiated, as well as uh, Athen registry and uh, other registries that are being developed to uh, collect such information. But, you know, there's always two sides to the story. We can't practice medicine. It's not black and white. There's always nuance. And then the next slide is a reminder that some of our patients could be at risk of clotting. And my dear colleague, Jonathan Roberts in Peoria reminded me on Twitter, uh, that he didn't want to be a Debbie Downer, but he did want to point out that uh, for as much as our patients who are on standard products like uh, Cogenate or Avate or on extended products like Alprolix or Lactate, um, you know, in, in that regard or, or Jibby, that um, it's unlikely their levels will consistently be at a point where they could clot. Um, 
So there is some concern with those uh, uh, products like emicizumab where your levels don't go up and down, but they're always at a, a slightly higher level than what you would, then certainly a higher level than what you achieve with standard prophylaxis. And maybe they could be at risk, but there's been no danger signal yet. And I want to reassure our patients who are on emicizumab that uh, even though your factor A level may be at the equivalent of 40%, my God, that is so much less than what we're seeing in our non-hemophilia patients in the ICU in the 400,000 uh, range. So this kind of leads me to my take-home message in the last slide, that we don't want to downplay the need for using factor, and our colleagues uh, through the World Federation of Hemophilia have come up with specific guidance. Though I do have to say that it was really at the level of uh, the clinician and if any of you uh, would like to uh, see what we have, uh, we kind of translated that to, the, to what could be better understood by our patients. And we sent it out to all our patients. And it's on our website. If you uh, Google hemocenter.org, H-E-M-O-Center.org, or if you want to email me later, I can send it to you. We kind of uh, simplified the language. But in the initial guidance, they said that we should maintain higher clotting factors if you are a severe hemophiliac and you uh, develop a COVID infection. Uh, particularly, there are some concerns that maybe the severe coughing, and I remember your first webinar, Dr. Valentino mentioned that appropriately, that it could lead to bleeding. But I think it's more nuanced. We don't want to over-infuse. We don't want to overshoot the levels because theoretically, these people with COVID are uh, at risk of clotting. So uh, it's important if you are in the hospital that you're at a facility uh, that's affiliated with your hemophilia center that could check the levels every day or as frequently as indicated. Um, so if someone is in an outlying hospital, uh, serious consideration should be given if a severe hemophilia has COVID infection uh, that's bad enough to be in the hospital to perhaps be transferred uh, to a hospital that is um, in affiliation with the uh, local HTC. Then my last slide, and it's a nice segue into uh, what Dr. Ragney is going to first emphasize about our, our total uh, being, our total body, is that, uh, you know, it's very important during these times, uh, you know, to take time out for ourselves. Um, my bike is behind me, and that's how I commute to work. And even though I'm only about uh, six miles away, I usually start my day with about 20 miles, so I take the long way uh, back to work. And uh, my path always goes through the Erie Canal. And uh, at one of the parking lots, there's a, a great artist. I want to meet this person who uh, inspires me. Every week, there's a new message. So uh, I want to leave you with a message that you are definitely tough. You made it uh, through uh, living with hemophilia, uh, doing wonderfully. You are my own heroes. And I know uh, you can get through this with a little help of your friends, including us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kuitis. Um, One thing I'd like to ask Dr. Ragney is since I, I know that you've done um, a lot of work with uh, other non-factor therapies besides uh, uh, heme libra. So if a patient were on another non-factor, for example, fetusaran, what are the implications for lab testing, PTT, et cetera, and any other issues that might be related to the, uh, a non-factor therapy? Right. So I, I think the way that we monitor now would not change. So we're really uh, looking at, uh, in addition to PTTs, which are done routinely, but some of these uh, non-clotting uh, factor uh, management, uh, thromboelastogram. But the truth be known, um, we wouldn't anticipate there would be more bleeding or even more clotting in that situation. So we really don't think that there's anything different that you would do. And in any patient who's on a clinical trial, you would follow the standard monitoring that is required for that uh, during any time, including during this pandemic. So, uh, I mean, our goal would obviously, I'm sorry, thank you for that to be happy and healthy, to keep up friendships, 
to take walks, listen to the birds and smell the air. That's what I do when it's difficult. And I love to take pictures. This has been a beautiful spring. I've taken pictures of, of trees and flowers. And I really think if you can sit back and say to yourself, you know, there's a lot of controversy and we don't have a lot of evidence and there aren't any trials. So we really need to be in touch with our hemophilia center on all the questions. And on the next slide, I have to say there are many controversies. There are few answers. Your HTC is the resource and your NHF is the resource as well as the World Federation of Hemophilia. It's a difficult time, but we're there with you. We are gonna ride it through with you. And on the final one, um, you really need to be happy, healthy, and mindful. And another thing that I love to do is soak in art music and books. It really is delightful. I'm reading a couple of books right now. It's just marvelous. I have more to do than I can imagine. And I have way too many conference calls and there's too much stress, but I love to do some of these things. It makes me feel better. And I suggest you think about these things and summer's coming. So that's what I would have to say. Thank you. tried to make uh, throughout the, the webinar series is, you know, it, you have to uh, relax, you have to try to reduce your stress, whatever mechanism you have to do that. I so, had no idea. I haven't been on your, I haven't seen those, but, so that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. So, Megan, you know, do you have a good book tip to give us? A good I'll, book tip? I, I'm reading Peter the Great. I'm telling you that guy was amazing. Uh, he, he, and there was no such word as no. He was the essence of true grit. He got through everything. It didn't matter. They didn't have culture. He brought it in. He imported everything. No, no way to get to the sea. He got. He built a ship, multiple ships. He he went and learned how to do it all. I I, I just think the guy is amazing. True Love it. So let me let me ask one other question. When we were talking about uh, the inhibitor population. Do you think that the treatment for COVID-19 would be different for a, pe a person with hemophilia with an inhibitor? No, no. And, and just think about it. What we want to do in a patient with an inhibitor is assure that we have hemostasis. We would do that in any patient with or without an inhibitor. So if what you're using now is 7A, you would continue to use that as your treatment. Uh, if you're using FIBA, you would do that. If you're on Hemlibra, you would continue on that. I mean, there's nothing unusual. I certainly think the PTT needs to be monitored. And with all patients, whether you're on Hemlibra or not, whatever drug you're taking, the key is to be realizing that you may have a different interpretation of that PTT if you have to also take heparin. That's why you need to talk with your physician and make sure that they're uh, walking with you every step of the way and helping with management through the hospital. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sure. So let's turn it back to Brett. Maybe you can uh, begin with the questions that have come in. Yes, sure, absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll start from the top here um, and just throw it out to the panel. Do you think because of the shortage of blood donations, there might be a shortage of factor products later in the year? You know, that's interesting. There's not, there, at least in Russia, New York, in our little uh, part of the world, uh, our uh, Red Cross has uh, had record uh, uh, visits of people wanting to donate. Well, and the other thing that I would say is most many, if not most, uh, patients are using recombinant drugs, not all, but um, they, of course, would have nothing to do with blood donations. So I think uh, in, to, to the extent that we're seeing more recombinant products being used, or certainly uh, Hemlibra, which is a monospecific, uh, a bispecific monoclonal antibody, uh, we're not worrying about donations in that regard. Yeah, I just want to say as a tangent, the um, you know, hemophilia companies may help uh, turn this around when eventually uh, they are able to market hyperimmune globulins. So many of them, there's now a consortium of CSL, Ripples, and Alpha Pharma that is putting together a manufacturing uh, process to obtain uh, antibody from people who are exposed, who develop COVID infection, and then infuse it back to the patients who need it. Right. So we would, we would strongly encourage those that have recovered from COVID-19 to uh, consider donation of their plasma to, to create this product, which could be life-saving for another patient. The one other concern that I would say, though, is that um, it's important that we continue to have blood donations. 
outside of the hemophilia population, um, immunodeficiency and uh, diseases like alpha-1 antitrypsin still use plasma-derived products pretty extensively. So it's important to maintain the supply of those products into the future. So blood donations will continue to be critically important. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, are the drugs for the HIV community members at risk of shortage? I have not heard a thing about that at all. Uh, they, there's really, the only thing I think you ever need to worry about with those drugs is drug interactions. But with the drugs we're talking about for COVID, heparins or uh, convalescent plasma, which we just heard, it would not be an interaction with those. Uh, I am not aware and I'm very reassured not to have heard a single problem with HIV drugs. Uh, although much of what we're going through right now reminds me of what it was like with the HIV epidemic. So, yep. Great, thank you. Next question. Um, I noticed the leading vaccine from AstraZeneca slash Oxford uses adenovirus delivery via shot. Will this impact gene therapy options that I believe also use that delivery system? What's the delivery system I in here? Adenovirus. Oh, adenovirus, okay. Uh, I, I can't answer that question. I am not aware. Certainly all of the vectors we're using today are AAV uh, with no uh, risk of uh, production issues. No, uh, no, I think we're reassured there's no problems with those, any interaction with this COVID virus. I am not aware. Those are all uh, just using the shell of the virus as a vector, not the true virus. Uh, but yeah, I can't speak yeah. to the adenovirus. I, I am not aware. So I, again, I'm uh, not an, an expert in that field other than that I serve on our IRB and we have an emergency approval for our own uh, local vaccine program. And my understanding is, is that, you know, they're actually, it's using the RNA of the virus and then they encapsulate it with lipids and protein. I've never heard of using the adenovector. I can't believe well, they in would. Fact Yes, and in fact, it was the adenoviral vector that caused such terrible liver dysfunction that it's really not used. I'm surprised to hear this. Yeah. I, certainly something could have changed, but for what I am aware of, that is not uh, the number one approach. And Russ, I'm sure there's over 100 uh, candidate vaccine uh, projects going on. So out of those, there's got to be a winner. But uh, I think maybe there's, it's being misunderstood about that. Great, thank you. Um, next question, are patients with type with blood type O at lower risk for microthymi? Well, I was gonna also tweet that too, but uh, we're trying to collect the data. As you know, patients with blood type A have a higher uh, you know, risk of an adverse course. So a number of us, and Maggie also being world renowned in BWD, I, is probably looking at their own institution, but we are also collecting that information. That theoretically blood type O by virtue of having a 15% lower level, uh, you know, may, um, uh, um, you know, may reduce your risk, but that's more, again, theoretical. Maggie, are you looking at that at uh, Western Pennsylvania? They're always looking at blood types. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's anything going on specifically re related to this. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, is NHF, WFH, or CISNA collecting data on our hemophilia patients? So we mentioned some of those ongoing initiatives, the NHF patient survey, the uh, question in Athen, and, um, I, and then my colleagues uh, through the uh, Hemostasis Thrombosis Research Society will also uh, be embarking on a registry. Um, CISNA is the present president, president uh, I have to say that uh, we are overseeing all these organizations. So it's not that we ourselves are doing registry, but we are trying to uh, facilitate such work through uh, groups like HRS, AFN, which are part of uh, the umbrella of uh, CISNA. Thank you, Prasad. Another question just came in. Um, do you think the drug from Desivir has any contradictions to patients with bleeding disorders? So again, by proxy, I become somewhat uh, knowledgeable in this area since uh, we also had emergency review of our IRB for this uh, drug, this drug is made by Gilead, which has helped so many of our hepatitis C patients with hemophilia. So 
I'm hopeful uh, this drug will also. And uh, my understanding of the side effects, uh, there's not been any danger signal or concerns. Great. And Len, there's a question in the um, in the Q and A section. I'm going to ask you to jump in there and take a look at. I I'll, I don't want to uh, hack it up too much there. So. Uh, so let's see. That question is, if you have a severe platelet, uh, if you have a low platelet count secondary to type two B von Willebrand disease. How would you manage these petechiae um, and rashes are also observed in COVID-19 patients? Uh, how, how would you differentiate the COVID-19 rash, for example, from uh, the petechiae that could be caused by uh, von Willebrand disease? Well, you know, we know what petechiae look like. They're very, very, very pinpoint. Uh, they are different from the rash of COVID, but, but they are mostly at areas of pressure uh, they may be pendant, but uh, the very good reassuring thing is that uh, COVID is very rarely associated with severe thrombocytopenia. While you can have mild thrombocytopenia, usually above 100,000, it's not associated with low, severely low, or very rarely is. And so it should not really make that huge a difference. In other words, if you have type two, to the von Willebrand disease, you need to use clotting factor if you were admitted to the hospital to uh, improve your uh, risk of bleeding, which is the standard treatment. Uh, you would follow the standard guidelines for anyone with type two B. And if you had bleeding, Despite uh, using a uh, von Willebrand factor concentrate, uh, we sometimes give platelets in that setting, but that's really um, not the standard prophylaxis. It's mostly a hospital uh, surgery or intervention for major procedures. So I would think that this would have no bearing on the subject. I think we'd monitor your platelets very, very closely and watch for bleeding, but I think I would put you on prophylaxis with your von Willebrand factor during a hospitalization for COVID. Thank you, Dr. Ragney. So we had one other question about uh, uh, hyper or uh, uh, convalescent plasma. If a hemophilia patient were to contract COVID-19 and recover, would they be eligible to donate plasma for uh, convalescent plasma use? You know, I'm not sure about that. Certainly you're using the plasma for those antibodies. So even though you have low clotting factor levels, that's not the purpose of using them. So it might be that it could be done, but quite frankly, you're already discounted as a donor if you have a bleeding disorder. Yeah, they, they're really leaving the regulations, uh, the criteria pretty lax. So we're following the Mayo Clinic uh, uh, protocol and uh, conceivably they could uh, donate. Um, again, I'm really putting all my eggs in the basket of the hyperimmune globulin from these affiliate the companies because uh, to give one unit or two units of plasma, you're only raising the immune globulin level by 5%. And uh, some people argue, since you're not getting a very high, you know, rise, maybe it should be used when you have the early onset of the infection. But well, actually, you know, it's, you know. yeah, actually, a uh, paper came out today in JAMA, and actually they were suggesting that the problem was why it didn't look like it, the convalescent plasma work was because it was given at day 21 at, of the infection, and shouldn't you be doing it at day 14? And I, I think, again, no data, no, no, you know, this is just speculative. Nobody has lots of data, nothing confirmatory, but I think you're right on there. But it's been the practice pattern of clinical research, like in cancer, you only, you know, first study those people who have failed all other treatments. So at our institution, these people all have to be on a ventilator and you have to have a high, uh, you know, sequential organ failure assessment score, SOFA score. So. Right. I think both of our speakers bring up a really good point um, that. You know, there's been a uh, an enormous amount of information, uh, and we're almost in an information pandemic as well. Yes. Much of this information is being published without adequate peer review. So it's important that if you are looking into any medical literature, you have to understand that this has not undergone rigorous peer review prior to its release to the public. So these this information is potentially... Um, you know, going to change after peer review. So I would just caution anybody who's looking at medical literature because it is coming out so fast and quickly. 
please contact your HTC to get further information about any of the questions that you might have. Great, thank you. We've, we've got about five minutes left here and um, I'll give each of you 30 seconds to a minute to maybe just go through and, and any closing remarks that you wanted to, uh, wanted to add. Um, Peter, we'll start with you at the top. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I can speak for the whole uh, community of caregivers that we are very, you know, uh, uh, you know, willing to, uh, you know, uh, work uh, closely with all of you and uh, reassuring you and uh, knowing that, you know, uh, we don't think there's any uh, major risk. Uh, you know, in terms of one last thing, I just want to say, uh, in terms of um, uh, you know peer review, uh, it is, is is my screen being shared? Yeah, sorry about that, Peter. That was uh, me on my end. Okay. <laughs> so this is a tweet I put out two days ago, and it uh, echoes what Maggie is saying. Calling all medical journal editors, can you all take a deep breath and slow down? I, I get it. You all want to help. Thank you. Can't slow down. That's the problem. But, uh, you know, Next this time. is what we're worried about. So please, you know, please uh, review all this critically when you come across some internet report about, um, you know, uh, you know, about um, uh, the patients and COVID. Uh, please, you know, review pretty critically. Please reach out to us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Maggie, we'll go to you next. You know, I would just say this is a difficult time. There's a lot we don't know. Uh, and I like to write uh, poems and songs about that. But really, I think uh, you just got to be happy, healthy, take walks, enjoy the arts, uh, try to be positive, it, 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 share time with your friends, Zoom, uh, cocktail hour, whatever it takes, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Glenn, Len, if that wasn't uh, allowed. Uh, but we have to have fun, even despite all the stress. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. So my, my final comments would be, um, you know, the, the sort of the party line, social distancing, good hygiene, washing your hands, using hand sanitizer. Um, uh, wearing a mask in public, and by all means, if you are feeling ill, do not uh, expose other people at that time, and uh, definitely stay in contact with your hemophilia treatment center. That's really the most important uh, aspect of all of this. If you have any questions, contact your treatment center, and they can be a, a great source for you and allay much of your anxiety. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. I'd like Thanks to, Peter. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Yeah. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time tonight to join us. Um, we certainly appreciate your time and expertise. And I'd also like to thank everyone else for joining us. Uh, please note that this is, this is a recorded webinar and it'll be available on Monday, May 4th in the COVID-19 section on hemophilia.org. You would, you will also be able to find this information in the next weekly issue of our health and wellness e-newsletter from the desk of Dr. Valentino that will hit your inbox on Thursday mornings. Thank you for joining us this evening, everyone. And remember that we are always here for you. Thank you. We will have a good weekend.